Welcome to TEN, the Tenant Experience Network. I'm your host, David Abrams. Today we are connecting with Lisa Davidson, Vice Chairman, Savills North America. In this episode, we delve into Lisa's professional journey, which commenced fresh out of college. Initially uncertain about her career path, Lisa seized an opportunity with a small real estate tenant rep firm that visited her campus for recruitment. Expecting it to be a stepping stone, she quickly discovered a natural fit for her skills within the tenant representation domain, leading her to devote her entire career to Savills. We both share a personal connection to Mitch Steer, the former chairman and CEO of Savills North America, who now serves on Hilo's advisory council. Lisa has since ventured into angel investing in the prop tech space and is a member of the Hyde Park angel community. In our discussion, Lisa sheds light on key market drivers influencing real estate decisions, such as the rise of amenities and spec suites. She describes the future of work as accommodating employees with great space. The impact that unique community spaces have on potential tenants as they are touring prospective spaces is something else she sees in the market. Drawing from her professional insights and client interactions, Lisa shares compelling observations on the evolving tech landscape within buildings. I really enjoyed our conversation and appreciated the opportunity to learn through Lisa's unique lens into the industry. Stay tuned until the end as Lisa reveals her philosophy on making her life bigger, something we should all do. We're excited to share this podcast with you, so be sure to subscribe to TEN so you never miss an episode of the Tenant Experience Network. And now I'd like to welcome Lisa to the show. I'm really glad you could be with us today. How are you? Thank you. Good. I'm glad to be here. Awesome. I'm looking forward to our conversation and getting to know each other a little bit better. So to kick things off, if you could tell uh, us, myself, our listeners, um, a little bit about your journey to your current position role. How did you get started in the business? Uh, Well, I've actually... uh, gotten got this uh role right out of college (laughs) so not of course the title but uh, acting as a tenant rep so um i uh, grew up in chicago went to northwestern and when i got out of school i had uh like many college graduates zero idea what i wanted to do Uh, but i thought having been introduced to the business um purely through a small tenant rep firm that was recruiting at my school. Mm. Uh, I thought, I had no interest in real estate, by the way. I uh, simply thought that it would be a good way to get to be familiar with a lot of different industries, meet some people, and maybe then I'd figure out what I wanted to do for a living. Uh, But as soon as, you know, as soon as I um, started in the industry, uh, it was clear that my degree in communication studies and economics were the perfect combination uh, for this career. So I became a, a tenant rep right out of college, and uh, I've spent most of my career at Savills, which actually used to be called Dudley. I don't know if you're familiar with yep. that yep. name, David, but Savills acquired us about seven or eight years ago. Um, so most of my career I've been, that's what I've been doing. And um, I know you asked me earlier what the title of vice chairman indicated. Right. So um, at brokerage firms, it has to do with how successful you are and how much and how much revenue you bring into the firm. So, uh, you know, if you, from now on, when you look at brokers, you can correlate the title Okay. to the revenue they bring in. So that's pretty much how how it works. And of course, uh, um, you know, our former chairman, Mitch Steer. And uh, so Mitch actually uh, made me a board member of Savills when, when he was still here. And so that's what the director is indicative of. Wow. Well, yes. Yeah. So we have the, the friendship with Mitch in common. Mitch is an advisor on our advisory council and, and, and a great friend and mentor and colleague. Um, and so vice chair, so you're a heavy hitter. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't know about that, but <laughs> uh, um, but certainly I've been at the firm a long time and I love doing what I do and right. have um, made a living doing it. <laughs> That's amazing. So, as you said, you you thought you'd end you'd start in this position role and see where your career would take you. So, is there is there another any? Is is it, what do you think? Are, are you are you in it to win it? Could you imagine or see yourself doing something different? 
you know, it's I've I've thought about that throughout my career, honestly. Right. But uh, I don't know. No, I really I enjoy what I do. I don't think there's um, you know, I I don't necessarily see unless something leads me there. You know, uh, not doing this and then doing something else. Something else I do do though, which you know all about, is angel mm -hmm. investing, and right. so. Um, uh, my work as a tenant rep actually is what brought me to the space of, uh, the tech ecosystem. And, you know, for a long time, it was tech that was really driving office space, all these tech right. firms growing. And so I naturally wanted to learn more about that. Mm. And I got involved in, um, an organization called Women Tech Founders in Chicago. Through that, naturally, I met some women tech founders and- right how I began my investment journey and uh, learned. So I kind of see that as my second career because through that, it was an education and um, uh, learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes. And uh, now I'm with Hyde Park Angels and, you know, that is great fun. Like my very own uh, Shark Tank episode every month. <laughs> right. Amazing. Well, you know, you, you, you've been able to sort of parlay that, that wisdom and experience and, and sort of bring it to the tech ecosystem and, and offer your expertise there. And also obviously taking a, a more, an interest even beyond um, observatory, but actually making an investment. So that, that's amazing. Exactly. And I'm excited about this conversation because you'll have the lens of, you know, both an active um, participant in the, in the, in the commercial real estate ecosystem, you know, representing tenants, which is a very important Part of our discussion, um, but also perhaps some of your insights in, in other companies that you've been connected to. So this is going to yep. be fun. I'm, yeah. I'm just curious before we dive in, um, yeah. in terms of the role and in terms of how you, you've you built a career and, and stayed at this firm, what else do you think contributed to your success? Like, why do you think you are so uniquely suited, not only for the industry, but also maybe for this firm and, and, and really growing up in it? Um, oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, when I think back, um, Savills, when I first started, and as I said, it was Studley, it was a very um, internally competitive firm, and it was a little bit sink or swim. And I think that um, that atmosphere spoke to me and gave me some good kind of basic skills that I've, I've kept my, uh, during out my, during my career and the bad times as well as the good times, uh, those business development skills uh, mm -hmm. when we first start, cold calling, that sort of thing. And um, also, you know, I I also, um, I guess at the time, didn't feel like I had a lot to lose in the sense that, um, you know, I came from a very modest background and I didn't have family that um, was in any professional business that could help me. And so I, I had a little extra motivation mm -hmm. um, when put in a sink or swim atmosphere to um, you know work hard and figure it out. That's amazing. I think there's and, a lot to be a lot to be learned from that experience. And I will say that um, Studley in particular rewarded that. So you could start out as a young person. And mm. if you had those sort of skills that could open doors and make cold calls, uh, you were rewarded for it. So I think that's what made it uh, um, uniquely the right firm for me. Nice. I love it. Um, you know, I started this podcast uh, at a rather strange time, but I started it obviously uh, just as the pandemic was taking root in July of 2020. Um, perfect time. <laughs> yeah, perfect timing. Um <laughs> Um, you know, I just felt that the the media, the press was was just looking for um, uh, the 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 headline that would create controversy, <laughs> and and I was really just looking for the voice of reason. I was looking for you know real people with you know what was really happening in the marketplace, and I just wanted to talk to really smart people in in all parts of the commercial real estate ecosystem, um, brokers, buyers, sellers, owners, um, property managers. And also occupiers and and prop tech companies as well. So it's been an, an incredible journey, uh, sixty plus episodes. And wow. I, you know, I come out of, off each episode and just feel like I, I learned so much and I get to meet amazing people. Um, so I'm glad that we could you know be together today. And you know, what we're really trying to do is understand you know how is the conversation around the future of work and how and where people work evolving. Um, and I and I'm really just again focused on you know what are you thinking and seeing today versus 
you know, telling me what you think will be in 12 months or, or 36 months. Cause um, as I've said with other guests, like we don't know, um, mm-hmm. you know, we can only guess. So I really love just getting perspectives, you know, from today. So I'm just curious if you could share with our listeners, you know, how is your business um, and, and sort of the, the view and the lens that you have on the business continuing to evolve or innovate to meet the needs of your customers and you're repping the customer. So mm-hmm. um, you, you're, you, are, you are such a key component in this whole commercial estate conversation. You know, what is driving or influencing the directions that you're taking? Yeah, well, um, that's a, you know, that's a great question because, you know, I remember at the, at the uh, start of the pandemic, everybody kept saying, well, you know, once Labor Day comes, everybody's going to come back. And then in Chicago, it was once winter's over, then once summer's over. <laughs> and there hasn't been, I would say, all over the country necessarily a big rush back. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been more of a drip, drip, drip. You know, I think uh, the owners of companies, most companies, I'll, I'll put tech companies aside. They're a, a, a different breed, uh, mm-hmm. startup tech, that is. But most larger companies came to the conclusion that, yeah, we do need office space and we do need people to right. to return. And they came to that conclusion. Um, and, you know, many are continuing, as I said, it's sort of been like a drip, drip, drip. Not everybody at once um, continuing to tell their workers, you know, they need to come back at least a few days a week. I think, you know, um, Fridays are gone forever <laughs> but in terms of back in the office. But um Everyone, uh, you know, responds a little differently. I, I don't necessarily see a lot of companies that are willing to enforce mm-hmm. uh, the return to office. So, you know, that's a bit of a quandary for my tenants in terms of figuring out how much space that they need. Uh, but the one thing that I will say um, is commonality across the board is that uh, companies want to make the office as easy, accommodating, exciting as they can to lure their employees back, to make them want to come back and yeah. want them to come in. So, um, you know, so I feel, you know, our my role with companies is helping them not only find that space that has all the amenities um, that are necessary to bring uh, employees back, um, but how how to make the deal work? Because at the same time that they want this space, construction prices have continued to escalate and remain high. Um, so one thing um, would be we're really looking wherever we can at taking advantage of existing conditions. Right. And um, you know, landlords have met that call in uh, many buildings. Um, putting together spec suites, even yep. for, you know, 50,000 square foot tenants, they're putting together spec suites because for the most part, um, a lot of firms want very similar space in terms of, I mean, there are exceptions like law firms still have their offices, but um, outside of a few industries, uh, companies want open space with rooms for Zoom and collaboration and conferencing. So, um, so companies are, landlords are able to do that, put together these large tech suites. Um, the other thing that's on my mind right now when I'm working with somebody is protecting them because we're seeing a couple of things in this marketplace. One is that you can get to the point of negotiating everything, signing that lease, and then the landlord coming back saying, uh, the, land, the lender won't approve this. Mm. Um, so that risk has always been there. Nothing is is finished until it's signed by both parties. Um, but it would really be an odd thing to negotiate a whole lease and then have somebody come back and say that, but but no more. Now, you know, that's a real possibility every time. And so you have to um, kind of stay on top of, you know, is this a real deal? Have backups, be ready for that to happen. Right. Um also, even after you sign the lease, um, you might have in the lease that, you know, a landlord is going to renovate or put something in the building. And, you know, if you don't have those dates and you don't have some way of holding them to it, mm-hmm. um, we've seen that happen too, where, you know, it might be in the lease, but then they decide they're not going to put good money after bad and 
they don't perform. Um, same thing with tenant improvements, you know, make, making more sure through escrows, through understanding a landlord's financials, you know, can they really perform? Um, so there's a lot of, you know, a lot of nuances. Right. Um, what we do at this space. But I, I think, you know, the future of work is um, accommodating your employees by, right. you know, having uh, having a great space to work at. Yeah. So just a, a sidebar question. Do you see the role um, as tenant rep, you know, now, maybe over the last year or two and, uh, you know, looking a little bit forward as being even more integral to the process? Because you just identified some of the pitfalls, some of the challenges. You know, are these, you know, were these issues always there or have they become and and so is your voice and your advocacy on behalf of the tenant become even more important right now? Wow. So this is a real layup question. <laughs> <laughs> of course, David. <laughs> of course, we're more important. Um, no, I mean, they've always been there, but for sure more important because those bad those bad things could always happen, but they they seldom did. And now right. and now they actually do happen. There okay. are real possibilities. So um, having somebody who can um, get ahead of that right. and understand how to navigate it certainly is more important than other. The other thing is, um, you know, just taxes in many cities, certainly in Chicago, continue to rise. And that that is an area where, um, you know, not every broker um might go the extra step of telling a tenant, okay, this is today what the landlord is charging, passing through for taxes, mm -hmm. but not really look, analyzing it to see what the probability is that, you know, in the next year or a couple of years, you're going to get a giant tax bill, like that the taxes right. will increase significantly. And I, I see, especially I look at, um, uh, of course, I sit in Chicago, so I'm thinking of Chicago examples, but Fulton Market is, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you're familiar with that area, but it's um, a newer sub market in Chicago that became very hot, especially during the uh, pandemic, sort of like our version of New York's meatpacking district. And, um, you know, it was sort of sold that, like these are smaller buildings and it's out of the main loop, so the taxes are going to be less. And that ha absolutely has not been the case. So now that that tenants have leased there and um, the market is a little more mature, um, taxes are as much, if not more, than wow. the main central loop buildings. Wow. Um, you know, we, you touched on earlier about you know, sort of the office footprint and how that's evolving. I had uh, Rob Coomer on the podcast just a, a week or so ago. He's the uh, the new CEO of Kingset Capital here in Canada, a very large private equity real estate investment firm. And he shared that he said, you know, a, a company might come to them and say, listen, we, we're, we're located in this building today. We'd like to come to one of your buildings, but we'd like to reduce our, our footprint by 80%. And then they go through yeah. the process and they analyze and they discuss and they figure out how much collaborative space and how much open space and how much casual space and yes but we still need a few offices and maybe a few meeting rooms and they get right and, and you know where they land back at 100 percent right of what they started. had in the other building yeah no absolutely we see that too the tenants get the idea that nobody's coming in and um so maybe they can reduce their space by 80 percent um and uh absolutely i agree i see that all the time and and sometimes um it's sometimes it's not i would say most of the time it's not coming back to 100 percent but it's certainly a lot a lot um more space than perhaps they thought before they started really digging into what they need and even if you know like they might say you know so these people um uh share this space for example but, but then on this day you know we want everybody to be in well, right and, and everybody <laughs> needs space right how do you well, do that yeah yeah and for sure and, and and if we do land at a fairly consistent three three plus days a week um, the reality is that you still need space for everyone. So, yeah, but we, but people are, but people are um, going to a model where um, they're not necessarily having a seat for every employee. Right. So, so we do see as leases roll as they expire, um, for sure, people are taking the same or less space, but right. not 
There, there are some drastic examples. Unfortunately, I have some of those clients who are right. have gone from eighty thousand to eight thousand. Right, uh, but but often there are other extenuating, you know, business and economic circumstances as well that are dictating that. Well, those are those are firms only who um, are like pretty much embracing remote work. Like right. they're saying, you can stay home, and but if you want to come into the office, we'll have this ten thousand square. Feet feet here for you to visit right. um, and come in when you need to. But that's more of a company that's embracing remote work. Right, right. And we'll see long term, um, you know, whether that model is really sustainable. Well, well, you know, what's interesting, David, is um, I remember um, after it's going back a while, but I remember after 9-11, mm-hmm. um, nobody wanted to be in the high rise portion of a building. Sure. Uh, because they just started thinking of other, you know, not just terrorist attacks, but like, what if there's a fire? Or what if, you know, um, other things? Uh, they didn't want to be in any building, like, let's say, in Chicago, Willis Tower, that could be a potential target. And you could not give these buildings away. And that lasted for a while. You know, I want to say that lasted maybe like five years post 9-11. Right. And I don't know what the dividing line was or what the trigger was, but one day that all went away. Right. People went back to life <laughs> and now those buildings are getting premium rates. Yeah, yeah. No, listen, uh, history does repeat itself and we do yeah. evolve and we do forget um, yeah. and we do move on. So um, so I know I said earlier that I'm, I'm going to focus on the here and now, but I do have one question that sort of touches on what might be. So if budget and resources were not an issue, you've got an infinite amount of money and you know, could do anything your your wildest dreams you could imagine. What three new initiatives would you undertake to position your business for success over the next three to five years? Um. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um. I don't know. I don't know if I'll come up with three. Um. So just any business new initiatives. I mean, I hate to be re- repetitive. Obviously, I'm thinking in the in the office boat space mode, but um. You know. For sure, like I don't, I don't ever think you can go wrong with when it comes to real estate with going for the top. You know, like just um, getting the best space you can and the best location. Uh, I I think you cannot go wrong with that. And certainly technology. You know, um, buildings that um, uh, help you get as efficient as possible. Right. Um, and um, uh, also, just from a environmental standpoint, um, not only, you know, just looking at like, are there any buildings that are lead platinum or what mm-hmm. have you, but, you know, outdoor space, like access, you know, green access, space. yeah, access to green space. So, I mean, those are the things I'd be thinking about for the future if, if money weren't, you yeah. know, if money weren't mm-hmm. an object. Okay. All right. Um, I think we can both agree that, you know, and, and, and the building, the, 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 the business that building owners are in is no longer just about renting space. It really is about, uh, as we like to say, helping to create destinations of choice, make places destinations of choice. Um, and so that's really obviously, um, again, just as I gave you a layup, maybe giving myself a bit of a layup, that it really does come back to the experience that's offered. And yeah. we see that as a collaboration between both the building occupier um, and the building owner operator. Um, so I'm just curious, as, as we continue to see experience driving utilization and engagement, how are you seeing that phenomenon play out in the work that you do every day? Yeah, so it's interesting because, you know, again, things like tenant lounges or tenant spaces aren't necessarily new right but i do see them being used for so i'm i was sort of surprised that when a building puts in um a tenant amenity space that has things from like a pool table a dartboard um a bar for sure um a place where you can grab coffee with a barista these types of amenities I am telling you, they get used and they and they draw tenants. It creates community. It creates some stickiness to the building, I believe. And um, people really like those spaces. And I noticed that when we tour, you know, people's eyes light up when they walk mm-hmm. into a beautiful community space and they see, you know, there it's another place to work too. Like yeah. people come down there, pull out their laptops. In fact, some of the time I hear that 
Um, a, a nice tenant amenity space might also have these little booths that people can sit at to work. And yeah. they say those are, you know, the most coveted spaces um, in the in the place. So I, I saw uh, there's one um, tenant amenity center that I saw the other day where they have their own um, uh, wine. Um, oh, what's it called? Uh, like a wine cellar right. uh, where you could buy, you could, each company gets their own wine locker. Amazing. And so if you have some special vintages you want to yeah. keep there to entertain, yeah. I mean, it's just crazy what they uh, come up with. Yeah. That's amazing. I, I know there's a very interesting building in Chicago, um, relatively new. I think it was built and leased up during the pandemic. You may know it. It's got a full size NBA size basketball court. Um, oh yes, on yeah, the upper absolutely. Floor. One, but you're probably thinking of 167 <clears throat> Green and Fulton I, Market. Yeah, I am, and and apparently yeah. the, the the your your local Chicago basketball team, um, they come out and they play there, and other teams when they're visiting. Um, so it's become quite a destination, and and that yeah. building, you know, fully leased and premium rent. Yeah, and they they you that that's right. It is fully leased, and um, they and premium rent, and they I know they use that space as um, also they rent it out for like events. Event space. I who's having a wedding there. So. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, okay, let's, uh, we'll continue the conversation, but let's take a short commercial break and we'll be right back. Sounds good. This episode of 10 is proudly brought to you by Hilo. Hilo is a rapid deployment workplace engagement platform for the hybrid world that enables building operators to connect to their tenants, whether they're at work, at home, or anywhere in between. We are in the midst of a seismic shift in the evolution of the workplace. Now more than ever, it's clear that the most important asset of a building is the people. Commercial real estate leaders recognize that tenants and employees want new kinds of spaces, services, and amenities to support having the flexibility to work from anywhere. Workplace engagement solutions that connect hybrid working people to buildings no matter where they are have become a major differentiator as buildings compete to retain current tenants and attract new ones. Hilo empowers building operators to meet this challenge. To learn more about Hilo and schedule a demo, visit HiloApp.com. And now I'd like to welcome back to the show, Lisa Davidson, Vice Chairman, Savills North America. Really glad you could be with me today and I'm really enjoying our conversation. Thank so you. Co commercial real estate continues to be impacted by the introduction of new technology. And you opened the conversation by indicating that you are keenly aware and, and watching the, the prop tech space and and investing in new technology. So I'd uh, love to get your perspective on how you're seeing technology uh, you know, continue to roll out. Um, and not only from an operational perspective, but again, to my earlier comments about how it's enabling building operators to interact uh, with people and the spaces. So you know, really creating an unparalleled experience. So just curious, any thoughts you have on how technology stacks are evolving? Yeah, I mean, it's, it touches everything. I mean, I am an invest. There's, you know, there's one company I'm thinking of who has some technology um, where they create a digital twin of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the HVAC system for the landlord so that they can turn off and on tenant spaces when nobody is there, um, helping to save energy. I um, Emma seeing the security, you know, evolve, being able to use handprints and, um, you know, uh, for easy access in and out. I was in, in my own building the other day, the, the sundry, um, uh, shop is now employee list. You just go in with your badge. It's like an honor system. You, you know, right. check out yourself. Um, and certainly, you know, it, it's convenient for the tenants to communicate with the management office and um, to schedule um, access to the amenities and so forth. So it really is like touching everything, making everything um, easy uh, for people to, you know, communicate and, and get things done. Yep. Just curious, again, a side question. Are you seeing as you're repping tenants and, and they're looking at buildings, you know, are, are they starting with a question in and around tech, what technology might be available in a building to, to help facilitate a great experience for themselves and their employees? Is that entering the conversation or is it still early days? 
I think it's still early days. It's only the most sophisticated, um, mm. the only most sophisticated corporate users. Right. Um, who are going to come in and they want to know how they can, um, uh, how you might interface with their technology, how they right. can <clears throat> keep track of workers, you know, um, uh, obviously, a, a you know, basic thing uh, in terms of uh, inquiries from tenants, just like, you know, badge swipe data mm-hmm. and um, <laughs> and so forth. So um, so I think it is still early days, but it comes up with not just the most sophisticated owners, but perhaps the the folks who are looking at the class A top yep. level buildings um yeah. that would be a question they might ask yeah you know our, our our business is obviously very focused on the building owner operator but we think a lot about um you know blurring the boundaries between occupier and the building and that why should i as an employee as a customer of that building whether you know why do i need why should i have five apps and three websites and two portals yes um, <laughs> you know, i want a more seamless frictionless experience and just because the building is one entity and and my my employer is another entity why do i need you know multiple solutions to navigate my way through the built world experience and so we're thinking a lot about how our technology can evolve to you know create a, a situation where i actually as the end user be, am able to configure through technology the way in which i navigate through a building versus being imposed um and so it's exciting it's it's a really yeah, exciting no, and it- I think that's smart because, you know, like I said at the beginning, like employers are trying to keep their employees happy and that's what it's all about. That's what they're focused on. They're focused on, you know, is is my employee going to like coming here? That's right. Uh, And I will say, I don't know when that's changing because, you know, there was a there was a point when people were talking about recession and everybody was saying, oh, well, when, you know, what's going to happen when the pendulum swings and um, it's the, you know, uh, employers who have the um, upper hand. Uh, And then that never happened. And I honestly don't know when it will, because as I look at the demographics of uh, the baby boomers leaving the workforce and the new generation that's coming up, there's really not enough people to replace the baby boomers. Mm. So it's really hard to forecast a day when uh, you know, power suddenly, will shift back. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I think that you've got it right to focus on the person, the employee who's experiencing the building. Yeah, and generally, you know, you 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 giveth, you can't, it, you giveth. It's hard to taketh. I mean, For sure, when, yes. when you give, when yeah. you empower people, and 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 they are in a position of control or um, authority or. Um, there's another word that's escaping my mind at the moment, but you know, it's hard to take that away when, when they, when they, so I think you're to your point, the recession was maybe going to be another moment in time, but in the absence of that, and even if that were to happen, I'm not sure there'd be a huge shift. I'm really not. Um, yeah. and I think it's really now an opportunity for everybody to just come together and maybe even almost diffuse that power struggle and just say, we're all aligned. We all want the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, we want quality of life. We want to build successful companies. Uh, we want people to feel, you know, that they have the flexibility uh, to be at the right time in the right place. So, you know, maybe we're just, maybe it's just creating a new and a better world, and and that 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 tension and that struggle simply won't necessarily or need to be a part of it. I think that's a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, as you and I solve the, the world's all the world's problems, um, our clothing speed round is an opportunity to get to know you on a personal level, just a little bit better. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so, looking back. What is the one piece of advice that you wish someone had given you when you first started in your career? Oh, to make my life bigger. Oh. Um, and what I mean by that is, yeah. you know, I was very focused and driven, but I didn't necessarily go out of my way to make my life bigger by um, joining things and meeting people outside my industry and um doing whatever i could to interact with people that i wouldn't normally right. meet or see in my everyday i love that that's really great advice um do you have a favorite book or podcast that has positively impacted your approach to work or life um hmm 
Oh my God. I read, you know what? I listen to audiobooks all the time, but as I, as I, um, as I read, as I read them, as I listen to them, then they leave my mind. <laughs> um, the one, the one, uh, I don't know. I wouldn't say if it's positively impacted my mind, but the book I read recently um, has given me pause, and that was um, the by the Elon Musk biography. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> and the reason is because I had this um, idea of Elon Musk that wasn't, you know, necessarily favorable. Right. And uh, and I read the the biography and it just and I, I was encouraging um, people who felt strongly uh, had a strong negative attitude to read the book, because if you read the book, you see that. Um, uh, and understand a little bit about his growing up and just what he's thinking when he does things, what the intent was for certain things that maybe didn't turn out um, to look as though there was good intention. Uh, right. I think you you gain more empathy. And so what it's taught me is to, um, and I don't know, taught me, but like made me think about is slowing down um, and reserving judgment. judgment. And also like assume positive intent you know we we all have frustrations throughout the day um and in our careers and at home and i think if you know your go-to is to assume positive intent by the other person um that the world would be a happier place <laughs> well again gr great advice and, and and clearly a sign of some wisdom that you've accumulated uh, over the la over your your career, so thanks for sharing that. Um, name one way in which technology has improved how you live or work. Um, well, gee, I mean, it's uh, you know for sure. It you know people think of technology. I think you know our phones, our our computers, our devices as intrusive, mm -hmm. but honestly, um, it does. It does allow, I mean, this is obvious, but I, I really look at it positively from in terms of it gives everybody so much flexibility. You right. know, when I was first starting out in the business and I had a young family, um, if I was home with the kids, that meant all I could do was pretty much check my voicemail. There wasn't right. a lot else I could do. And um, I think in, you know, you had to make choices and, you know, uh, guilty feeling of guilt if you weren't at work, feeling of guilt at home if you were at work. Um, so I just think it's given particularly, you know, moms, like it's given mm -hmm. flexibility. Um, it allows for, you know, so much efficiency for choice. I mean, really, um, technology does get quite a bad rap and, you know, not, I'm not saying not for, for a good reason, but, yep. um, just, the, and knowledge, you know, just like being able, I mean, I don't know if you've been on uh, chat GPT, but <laughs> I'm sure you have with the rest of the world. But uh, I mean, there's just so much freaking knowledge out there um, <laughs> that can be, you know, at a touch, um, you can you can put together. So uh, yep. it's, yeah, it's endless. Yep, yep. But to your point, when used appropriately, it, there's, there are many benefits. Uh, yeah. You know, what factors do you consider when deciding where or how to work um, on any given day? Are you are you 100 percent remote? What, what is your what is no, your I'm week definitely or, or month not, look like? <laughs> definitely not 100 percent remote. Um, okay. You know, um, you know, it varies. But just like everybody else, I'm particularly in Chicago. I'm looking at, at everything from the weather to what I have to do that day right. to um where, you know, where I'm going to be later in the day, what's mm -hmm. most convenient, traffic, so on and so forth. Um, but also um, responsibility. You know, the one thing that we've all uh, talk about and acknowledge is that, that it's it's actually a lot easier for people of my age to be flexible and work remote because of all the years we've had at our companies and the experience, but new mm -hmm. people coming out of college, um, they don't know what they don't know. And it really benefits them to be in the office. So I think about my responsibility mm. uh, to be there for the younger people and be visible in the office. And 
and have access. And, you know, it's, it's a cliche, but I don't think I have a day that I don't go in where I don't have a conversation um, with a colleague that had I not been in, I would not have talked to because, right. yeah, because when I'm at home, I sure I, I call my team or the people I'm working on transactions with. But if I don't have a very specific reason for calling you, we're not yeah. going to see each other. Yeah. And <clears throat> that idea or conversation isn't going to happen. So, yeah. Yeah, my I, mental I, health I actually too. Was, I, I was sitting in our space the other day and I was just looking around and seeing and it's sort of a technology innovation space and just watching all the different clusters and the way in which people were engaging, interacting, you know, yeah. two people who were just side by side engaged in conversation, three people around someone's computer and engaged in a conversation. And and again, to me, it's the best of all worlds. I don't think it's one or the other, but I, I agree that those moments together um, can't 100% be replicated through technology maybe over time we'll see i, I shouldn't I, I won't say for you know for now and forever but um that's sort of how i think about the world today uh you know we really think about commercial real estate also in terms of the expertise and the resources and the people that you know have been traditionally in the business and we're we think that there are going to be new skills and new areas of expertise that are going to be required to deliver this new product this new you know these experiences any thoughts on how you're seeing um you know the way in which buildings are staffed and what kinds of people, what kinds of um, um, qualifications um, are necessary to deliver and meet the needs of the occupier of today? Well, it's too extreme. So I'll, I'll get the one out of the way because I already mentioned it where there's some amenities that that have a little, that they don't have staff, <laughs> like the right. sundry store, mm -hmm. that right away. But on the other end, staff like a hotel, mm -hmm. you know, just people there to accommodate and, uh, help make the workday frictionless. And right. so, you know, uh, more of what we talked about. So um, yeah, staff that's there to support and, you know, or off offer a community experience, connect people, um, make your life easier. Almost some buildings like make it feel like it's a, a special club that's for tenants only and, and perks that only tenants get. 100%. You know, we, we, we like to say that homes are becoming more office-like and offices are becoming more home-like. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, well said. Yeah. Um, okay. I know you you mentioned that you, you know, you came right out of, you know, college and this career just, you know, it, it captured your attention. But, and I, and I, if you weren't doing that now, if that wasn't the path that you set out on and, and you did talk about, you know, seeing the world bigger, like, just right now in the moment, could you see yourself being something different or doing something different if you could, on a, on the flip of a switch, um, do something completely different from commercial real estate? Um, maybe be a detective. <laughs> okay. Or, or, you know, working on one of those innocence projects, you know, the idea. So um, in our role, we have to do um, a lot of research and put things together, make things happen, push things forward, get over challenges. And when I think about, you know, that's the part of uh, one of the parts of my uh, career that I really enjoy mm -hmm. and get um, a good feeling from. And so um, my natural instincts to kind of want to dig deeper, figure things out, right. find out what's behind the curtain, um, would lead me to do something with, um, yeah, detective work, innocence project, helping people who have been wronged. That I of. love it. <laughs> That's big. That's powerful. And I love how it it's pick. It's not like it's just out in left field. It's it's picking up on certain skills that you feel that you have, but it's finding a a really um, amazing application. So that's very cool. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. Yeah, I was just going to add. I'm I, this. I also joke, and you'll laugh at this. I mean, this is kind of of silly, but I always <laughs> that I enjoy it. That when my um, kids went through the college process, right? I, I I'm one of those weird freaks who loved it. I like I yeah. loved. It was almost like what I'm used to in sales, like figuring out like what all these colleges are about, you know, what they're looking for, trying to um, help my kids figure out like for the first time, you know, at that point in their lives, they're like looking back at who they are and mm -hmm. uh, trying to convey that to somebody and, you know, helping them through that process. So my, my backup career would be a college counselor. So that, 
<laughs> That's, listen, I, 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 I'm, I am Canadian. I, I can't exactly appreciate oh, yes, it's or, true. Or, or understand, but I, I have enough American friends that I'm very well aware yeah. of the college selection process, the application process. And yeah, I intense. know that it's a very, very significant time in, in a young person's life and for <laughs> the whole family. I, I know right. many of my friends who did the college tours, right? Yep. They're yep. on the road, the road trips. Yeah. 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 Yep. So I get it. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for being with me today. It was a wonderful conversation. Love getting to know you. Love getting your perspective on all things real estate and also some of your personal anecdotes and, and sharing um, some tidbits along the way that I'm sure our listeners will, will appreciate. So again, uh, such a pleasure. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you, David. Good. All right. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. I want to thank Lisa Davidson for joining me on this episode of 10 and for contributing to the global conversation around buildings being part of a robust ecosystem, helping to build great companies, and that they are vital in the effort to cultivate and support great people and teams. The future of the workplace will likely take many forms, and we will continue to explore what that looks like together. Subscribe to 10 for more conversations with leading CRE industry professionals and experts who all have something to say about 10th experience and the future of the workplace. We love hearing from you, so if you enjoyed this episode of 10, please share, add your rating, and review us through your preferred podcast provider. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on a future episode, please reach out to me directly at david at hiloapp.com. And until our next episode, I wish you all continued success in building community where you work and live. Thank you.